I'm Noelle Subdis. I'm the risk manager for the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities. Um, we're very pleased to have such a good turnout today. Um, our initiative, uh, which we recently started, um, is to not only uh, prevent injuries to direct care workers, but also to um, reduce overall falls, slips, and trips of the individuals receiving services from the system. And so this is really our kickoff event, and we are very fortunate today to have three distinguished speakers from the Metro Health System, Cheryl Bradis, uh, Victoria Baden, and Jane Sacco. I hope I got it right. Um, uh, keep in mind that Steady U, A Matter of Balance, started in the um, uh, aging system. And so this has recently, well not recently, been incorporated into the developmental disability system and that's why you're here today. So when you are listening to this uh, wonderful presentation that we have for you in the morning session, uh, keep in mind that we will be putting out um, some toolkits uh, for the DD system and for Cuyahoga County providers uh, that incorporate a lot of the principles and tools, uh, toolkits you're going to be hearing today from our speakers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to them. I've been um, advised by the Bureau of Workers' Compensation to uh, let all of you know that in the event of an alarm, um, to evacuate to the parking lot. Thank you. Yeah, I, I generally tend to be pretty loud. Is that loud enough? You know, we're used to working in the hospital, so there's lots of noise in there, lots of alarms, just lots of noise and commotion. So we're generally pretty loud. Usually people have to tell us to bring it down a notch and be quiet. So, okay, so I'm Cheryl Bradis, like she said, and we're talking about, I'm gonna talk really about some normal age-related changes, because even obviously adults with disabilities are gonna move into aging, and you need to consider how normal age-related changes superimposed upon already um, you know, acquired or congenital disabilities, how that's gonna impact their risk for falls as they continue to age. And as Noelle mentioned, the Steady U was originally developed by the Ohio Department of Aging based on older adults. And so what we're gonna go through here this morning is just some normal age-related changes, and then Vicki is gonna talk about um, just what we can do is really important to be able to identify what the risk factors are. Regardless of the underlying etiology, that will need to be determined, you know, based on an individual basis. Okay, so basically I was just talking about um, the Steady U that was designed by the Ohio Department of Aging and based on older adults. And so I know you're all, you know, working with, you know, adults with disabilities in some format or another. But we have to keep in mind as they age, the age-related change is superimposed upon what other type of disabilities or you know, issues that they're facing now. Um, on the side, I take care of a girl that has osteogenesis imperfecta. And I could just see, even see how her condition has changed and progressed over the past. I've been with her for 17 years. I've been at the hospital for 28 years, but I've been caring for this other girl for 17. And so even as she progresses and ages and her condition changes, and even though she's still relatively young, her body's aging quicker just because of her condition. And so even with somebody who has a, an acquired or congenital disability, you also have to consider how age-related changes can be superimposed upon that and increase risk factors for falls. So we're gonna identify this morning what are some of those age-related changes that can put a person at risk for falls. Um, then Vicki's gonna talk about kind of a home safety checklist, interventions to try to help keep them safe, and really the important thing is identifying what the risk is, how to manage it to hopefully prevent falls. So that's kind of what we're gonna talk about in a nutshell this morning, and then Jane's gonna give us a summary of some of the Steady U principles. So in Ohio, as are you guys aware that, and I'm sure everybody's talked about it a million times already, that older adults, one in five will be 65 and older by 2030. So that's not that far away anymore. But here in Cuyahoga County, that number is gonna be one in three. So that's pretty significant when we think about issues related to older adults. 
um, or adults with disabilities that are aging and that can impact that number and what can we do to help prevent some of those falls from occurring because there's a lot of really devastating injuries that happen. So in the community, one in three older adults will fall. In the hospital, actually, though, it's the, the 30 to 55 age group that falls two-thirds of the time. In the hospital, on, only about one-third of the falls are in the older population. But out in the community, older adults are definitely the number one um, fall that occurs. And a fall occurs every minute. So just think about that, every minute, and an injury every five minutes and that someone comes into the emergency department every six minutes. And our most common fall is what we call fall from standing. So literally, they're standing and they fell for whatever type of reason, loss of balance, um, dizziness, um, tripped on something, but not like they're falling off of something. And that the falls in Ohio have increased by 202%, just like in the past, you know, 15, 17 years, that's really significant. But with that growth in the aging population and their increased risk for falls, that's why there's such a focus on fall prevention now. So just in Ohio, look how much money has been spent on falls just in Ohio, $1.1 billion. And then when you add in work-related loss, and these are direct care costs. So when you add in other types of costs in terms of um, you know, psychological impact um, and then isolation that people will sometimes put activity restrictions on themselves, that even compounds it even further. And that 58% of all the fall debts occurred in the home. So there's a lot of things that we could do in the home just to try to help keep people safe. We did a per, uh, fall prevention education yesterday as part of the Aging Mastery Program in the community. We probably saw maybe, I don't know, maybe about only 10 or 15 people there. But it was interesting how many people are putting their own activity restrictions on themselves because of fear of falling. And with that becomes a whole spiral of decline, and we're going to talk about that. And then about 25% in the nursing home. So definitely most common cause of hip fractures and traumatic brain injury. Does anybody, who, just by a raise of hand, how many people know somebody that's fractured a hip? Wow, look at that. Like if, if you could see what I see, that's like three-fourths of the room at least. How many know somebody that fractured a hip and died within the first year? So look, so that was probably half of those hands went up. So it's a really significant injury in an older adult. And you know, it obviously depends on the type of hip fracture, their other underlying comorbidities, um, you know, medications that they're on. It does take into account other variables and considerations. But about one in five will die within the first year. About one in five will go to a nursing home. About one in five will go to a skilled care. Another one in five can go to acute rehab, but they have to be able to tolerate at least three hours of therapy a day. Um, they come back home, but they never quite return to their baseline functional status. And then the other one in five do relatively well. But, you know, since that is such a significant injury and it can have poor outcomes and increased morbidity and mortality, that is why we really want to focus on how can we prevent some of those falls from happening because it is such a significant thing. And traumatic brain injuries, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. I'm going to show you a picture of an aging brain and why we really want to focus on if someone falls and hits their head. Um, and that the average cost of a fall for someone to be hospitalized is approximately $35,000. So, you know, it's, it's a really expensive thing, not only for the person, but for society. And fear of falling. How many of you guys deal, even talk about fear of falling with the people that you see? Does that come up in conversation? And, and what kind of conversations do you have about that? I'm just curious. I feel like we always learn so much just from the people that we talk to. Does anybody want to share what type of conversations you guys have surrounding that? Ooh, they're quiet as mice. <laughs> we have a taker. Okay, I have a, my, my mother's in her 90s, but she's very independent. She drops things during the day when she's home alone. Mm -hmm. so it looks like a crime scene when you go in there sometimes. Like she, she'll just leave it there because she can't pick it up. So don't pick it up, Mom. But then she might get in trouble. Later in the day, so that's what we worry about with her being 
Yeah, so Vicki's going to kind of talk about that for sure. You know, even, so this fear of falling, this is a pretty significant thing. And so what are the issues with fear of falling? You know, why does that matter? Well, what happens? People become afraid of falling, and then they don't want to go out. They, they isolate themselves, and they become weaker. And as they become weaker, they increase their risk. And so it begins this whole downward spiral of functional decline. And it's interesting because, what? I'm sorry. Oh. Mm -hmm. We have a fear that they're going to fall, so we don't initiate the activity because it's better that they just stay, stay there. Right, and that's a great point that you make, and that does come up. So there's a couple of different things about the fear of falling. Not only can it be a consequence of a fall, but it can be a risk factor for a future fall. So that's one situation. The other situation is maybe I didn't fall, but I saw my neighbor fall, and I saw what a devastating consequence it had for them. I know I have risk factors, so now that makes me nervous that I may fall. And then the other situation that comes up is exactly what you just said. Um, you know, Vicki's at risk for falling, and I'm really concerned about her, and I'm not sure what I can do to help her, so I almost become overprotective and kind of almost hold her back from doing things. And we hear that from when we present to older adults in the community, they said that's one thing that commonly happens because of course we want to protect our parents. We don't want them to fall. I mean, Vicki's mom has fallen, my dad has fallen, and you know, when we weren't around with them, and so you're trying to say, okay, these are the things that you can do. These are your risk factors. So based on your risk factors, what types of things can we put in place to try to maintain safety? Because when we don't know what those are in our toolbox, if you will, what type of strategies we have available to us, then it's easy to project our fear too onto somebody else. And so, right, that fear of falling can happen in three different ways. So from something you've witnessed, something you've experienced, or just because someone else is really worried about you. So that's why we want to talk about identifying what those risks are and what is in that toolbox that we can pull out. So really keep in mind that for older adults, there's really not one specific thing necessarily that makes them at risk for falls, or, or even adults with disabilities, or, even, or I think of Addie, you know, that, young, that girl that I take care of with the osteogenesis imperfecta. Just how her condition has changed over the past almost 20 years, and you know, other things that put her at risk, just being under anesthesia multiple, multiple times. You know, now she's developed a little bit of heart failure. And with the heart failure, it becomes shortness of breath with exertion. And so just different types of things that you need to address and manage as you're looking at what their risk factors are based on their underlying etiology so you can individualize it to that person. Um, and that, so it's really not one intervention per se that's helpful, but multiple types of things together, or at least knowing what your toolbox contains. So internal risk factors, think of muscle weakness, my gosh, it's like you guys have, just think how many conditions that you see that cause muscle weakness. I mean, just spit out a few of them, throw out a few of them to me. What kind of conditions cause muscle weakness that you see all the time? Cerebral palsy? What else? MS, for sure. What else? Even think about people who are having strokes. And, and so when I went to, um, I went to a school for, with Addie when she was young, with a lot of different children that had all kinds of disabilities. You know, they were born fine, then they had a stroke, loss of vision, um, you know, paralysis on one side for, you know, spinal cord injury, all kinds of different types of things. And, but the muscle weakness could be present for so many different reasons. So again, we're going to try to identify what is at risk and what we can do. A history of fall. Obviously, if someone has fallen before, it puts them at a bigger risk of falling again. And if you've ever gone into the hospital, do you guys go into the hospital with the people that you care for? Do you come in with them? Are you guys the ones that come in? Ever? So when, we, when patients come into the hospital, we'll always ask them, you know, have they fallen? What you know, what precipitated the cause? Because that cause makes a big difference. Um, and we kind of look at falls really in terms of four different things, if you will. People have a lot of risk factors. So we're basically saying they are anticipated to fall unless we put something in place to make sure that doesn't happen. An unanticipated fall, something happens that we did not we, we couldn't have predicted. They have all of a sudden a new onset seizure, a new onset blood clot, a, you know, a, a new um, what we call a syncopal event where they pass out from maybe a new arrhythmia. We don't know what it is. 
There's also accidental falls, right? People get caught on things, they trip on things. I mean, those are pretty common falls. And then we also have incidental falls. What is that? People put themselves on the floor. Why would somebody put themselves on the floor? Any idea? Sometimes people, because of a behavior, uh -huh. they'll go down, or aging with Down syndrome, mm -hmm. sometimes it's too much input, or and they feel more comfortable. Down. Right. And we've kind of debated, is that a fall or not a fall? Right, and, and, and so for those situations that you described right there, a lot of times we would put that in as a behavioral event, you know, because they are, a uh, fall is really considered an unplanned descent to the floor. And so for certain people, they do plan on putting themselves there, rather that is for psychological comfort, um, but there are people that put themselves on the floor because either they feel like they don't want to go back to where they came from, or they feel like they don't have a place to go. So if they have a fall per se, um, they, they can still remain there. And interestingly enough, every time we've ever had an incidental or behavior fall, we've never had an injury with one of those. So, you know, that in itself tells you, and the, the um, mechanism of injury will really be reflective on how the person fell. That gives us a lot of insight. But we definitely do see behavioral events. And we had somebody in there recently, and she, she had, um, what, what was her underlying condition, do you remember? But she always wanted to be on the floor. And so it's like, okay, if she's going to be on the floor, how can we do this so it's at least, for one, relatively hygienic, right? Because the hospital is not a clean place, let's be honest. Um, and so, you know, we got her a floor mat and, you know, we put blankets on the floor, and it's like it, it, you have to work with that person for who they are and, and what their situation is. Well, she, lived in, she came from a group mm -hmm. home, and, and the group home where she lived, her mattress was on the floor. And so for her, it was very uncomfortable for her to be in a bed off of the floor. And so she would literally, and so our fear was she would crawl out of the bed face first right. over and over again. And so for us, that was, you know, typically we would, count that as a fall, but for her, that was, she was putting herself on where she felt comfortable. So we said, let's stop fighting it and let's just work with her. And we did, and then we were able to make her more comfortable and it all worked out in the long run. But you know, think about how that has even come so far. Like, you know, like I said, I started at the hospital almost 30 years ago. And at that time, my gosh, we would put a posy vest on everybody. You know, we're gonna keep them safe. So let's basically tie them in the bed more or less. When you think about that and you look back, you think, my gosh, I mean, how unethical is that, truthfully? And so, you know, at least one of the things is really being conscientious of how to work for that, work with that person to keep them safe and, and um, make it realistic for whatever type of risk factors that they have. So we always ask, you know, when did the person last fall? Because a fall within six months, and what were the conditions? That's more likely that they're gonna fall again. Um, and that fear of falling, it's highest within the first mo six months after falling. It does tend to dissipate over time, but that is an important thing for us to consider. Um, and then gait deficits. I, I mean, same thing. You could think of all different types of conditions, right, that can make walking difficult. Whether or not they're picking their foot up high enough. Do they have foot drop? Are they shuffling their gait? And even with shuffling gait, that can occur for so many different reasons. And then visual and hearing deficits. And so think about, we were talking about this yesterday. Um, how, how many people have been to Playhouse Square? Probably quite a few in here. So think about for how those surfaces are. It's a beautiful place, there's no doubt about it. But have you ever seen anybody fall at Playhouse Square? We've seen quite a few people, and we've picked up quite a few people off the floor, and my mom almost fell with us last time when she was there. So think about how the stairs are, right? They're beautiful, they kind of go like this, but as they go like this, the depth of the step changes, and it curves, and it goes from skinny to wide. There's multiple patterns all over the floor surfaces, and so it can become confusing about where a ledge is or where a surface starts and ends. So even, you know, things like that, and if someone doesn't have, you know, hearing aids or their glasses on, it's hard to appropriately interpret your environment to identify what those risks are. So if you're with somebody who you know who is having some difficulty, it's something sometimes just as simple as pointing that out. And we're gonna talk about a concept called visual cliffing. And then impaired activities of you know, ADL, I mean, I don't need to speak to you guys about that, you know that inside and out. Illness, why does illness put someone at risk for a fall? 
What's the challenge there? So even think of anybody you care for. What happens when they become sick? Weakness? Right, so they might have urgency or frequency, right? They might have um, increased lethargy or become more tired. And so even with that urgency and that frequency, just like you're mentioning there, just to get to the bathroom, if you all of a sudden have to get to the bathroom much quicker and it was difficult for you to get there to begin with, you could imagine the things that can happen with that. And with older adults, there's a couple key points even with older adults. So older adults have a blunted thirst mechanism. So they don't drink as much and they kind of need reminders more. My dad's version of, oh, I drink water all day, hon. I drink water all day. He literally has a bottle, a water bottle like that, and he takes like the littlest, babyest sip that he possibly can and he considers that drinking all day. But you know, that's really doing nothing. So they're more prone to dehydration for one. And so with dehydration, obviously you can increase your chances of becoming dizzy, having um, balance issues just with being dehydrated. And then older adults also have a decreased immune response. So they have a decreased number of what we call killer T cells. So their response to a infection is not the same as for someone that's younger. And so for an older adult, it's not uncommon for them, their only presenting sign or symptom of a new onset illness or you know, underlying event is a new onset fall or a change in mental status. And you know you can see that also with people who have the inability to communicate that the behavior changes. And so when you see that, you know that should be a red flag too. By the time an older adult has a temperature, they're already in trouble. That's not the same as somebody who's younger. So if you know someone comes in with cough and chest pain and shortness of breath, you're like, okay, I may not know exactly what it is, but I'm pretty sure it's respiratory, right? But an older adult, they may just come in with that change in mental status or a new onset fall and just have a really low grade fever but have lethargy and you're not really sure what's going on. So it's much more investigative work to try and determine the underlying cause. Medications. How many medications do you think the older adult is on? So three, five, eight, 10. Yeah, we've seen, I mean, we were doing a research study on falls not long ago, and we were looking at underlying conditions that could increase or put a person at risk for falls and medications. And in some people, you would see 23 different types of underlying conditions and about 18 or 20 associated medications. Well, you know, my goodness. Just with that in and of itself, you're going to increase your risk of, of falling right there. And so the older adult, on average, is probably on at least five medications or more. And part of the challenge with that is not only drug-to-drug -to -drug interactions, but um, sometimes, you know, as people age, or even if they have, you know, disabilities that progress or change over time, like Addie has. The problem with that is they don't have just a core primary care provider anymore. Now they're seeing their primary care provider, they're seeing a cardiologist, they're seeing a neurologist, they're seeing all these different specialists. And if there's not good communication, what can happen? Different medications that could be, medications can be ordered that are the same medications. And I think we've become much better at that now. But sometimes people will see it as a brand name and a generic name, not realizing that they're the same medication. Or they don't realize that medications that they're going home on, um, they had surgery. So anybody you take care of could fall and have to have surgery, right? There's Tylenol and say Percocet, but they don't think about Tylenol that's in over-the-counter medications if they all of a sudden get a cold and now they're potentiating that effect. Or they'll take Benadryl for sleep. But an older adult has a change in their fat and water body distribution, and so that can impact how certain types of drugs respond to the body with aging at 65 versus if they started it at 25. And so drugs may need to be dose adjusted. Depression. Why would depression put somebody at risk for falling? And we do see that. Any thoughts on that? Feeling of hopelessness. Right. Risk taking for the wrong reasons. Yeah, those are great things. Did you guys hear what he said? Feelings of hopelessness, risk taking for the wrong reasons. A lot of times people that are depressed, they also tend to sleep more, right? and they isolate themselves, and with that, what happens? They become weaker, 
And as they become weaker, again, they increase their risk for falls. And then age greater than 80. So really, older adults tend to acclimate pretty well over time to normal age-related changes. But in the presence of illness or injury, those changes can potentiate or compound the effect. And so greater than 80. Um, yeah, my, my father-in-law is 84. You know, God love him. He just came through about a cancer, did relatively well. He's pretty healthy, still rides his bike, but he also still makes his own homemade wine. And, you know, he needs some reminders of that it's probably not the best idea to clean out the gutters on a ladder while you're drinking your homemade wine in the little cup holder, you know. So <laughs> things like that we need to <laughs> kind of remind people. But we like Maxine. We use her a lot. Are you guys familiar with Maxine? She says here, I have to take so many vitamin supplements now that I'm actually too full to eat any actual food. So she says, I figure a jelly donut has fruit in it, so that makes it healthy. Okay, so this is one of the pictures I wanted to show you. So this is an aging brain, and this is a brain of a 27-year-old. You can see the brain of a 27-year-old. There's not a lot of additional space within the skull. The brain takes up the majority of the skull. And so with aging, there's some normal atrophy that occurs in the brain. That's a normal part of the aging process. That doesn't mean that older adults are any less intelligent at all. When older adults complete exams compared to younger adults, they can do equally as well and oftentimes better. They have more life experiences. They have more knowledge. It just may take them longer to complete that process. So there's some slowing of the processing um, that just occurs naturally. But the thing that really matters with this, think about how many um, people take, it's interesting, we'll ask people, how many take blood thinners or know somebody that takes a blood thinner? They'll raise their hand or say, oh no, and then we'll say, well, how many people take a daily baby aspirin? The hands go up threefold from there. But people don't think of a baby aspirin as a blood thinner, which it is. They almost think of a, a, a baby aspirin almost like an M&M because it's something that's so common but it is a blood thinner. It, it has a lot of benefit to it. It definitely is cardioprotective, and there are definitely benefits to taking a um, baby aspirin. But when someone is having multiple falls and their risk is really high, then we have to begin to weigh the risk versus the benefit. And is it something that can actually cause more problems if they're falling often? But even if they've never fallen, even if they're on a baby aspirin, if they fall and hit their head, it's really important to have them evaluated. So what could happen? So you can see in this brain, for an older adult, there's more room in that skull for the brain to swell or a bleed to expand before the person would become symptomatic. Where in this brain, because it's so tight in the skull, they would show symptoms much, much sooner. So for an older adult, if they fell and hit their head, especially if they were on any type of blood thinner, including the M&M, the baby aspirin, they may not show symptoms for 12 to 24 hours, even up to 48. But by the time they have those symptoms, what happened? How much worse are they, right? Now that swelling is even more significant, that bleed is expanded even further. So just keep in mind that if you know somebody that's on any type of blood thinner, even the baby aspirin, if they fall and hit their head, make sure that they are um, evaluated. So, so just some visual changes that occur with aging. I mean, as most of us, you know, we're all sitting around here with glasses on. And think about when you first, how many people have bifocals? Think about when you first got your bifocals. How did you feel? I don't know, I sort of felt like I was drunk, you know, because it's that change between the top and the bottom, and especially on stairs. So Vicki's going to talk later about kind of the importance of stairs and what we can do to keep someone safe on stairs. But our iris is a muscle, and like any other muscle in our body, it doesn't have that same strength as when we were younger. And so that does begin to weaken, and that controls the pupil and the amount of light that's allowed into our eye. And so the pupil on an older adult will be much smaller than on your average adult which means one they can't take in as much light and two because that there's also the lens isn't as flexible and the light the eyes don't accommodate as quickly and so it's more difficult going from if you get up in the middle of the night right you, your eyes adjust pretty well to the dark but if you go in the bathroom flip on that light switch and it's that sudden bright light or coming out of a movie theater and it's that sudden bright light and then you know going out that our older eyes cannot accommodate as quickly and so there's an increased risk for falls with that 
and there's also decreased um, contrast sensitivity and decreased light dark adaptation and basically that's what really that comes down to is that less flexibility in the lens, the shrinking of the pupil size and the you know decreased um, like response of the iris. People's eye color actually can also change a little bit as they get older. About 15 to 20 percent of the population, their eye color will change just because of the magnet, the magnet, or how about the pigment <laughs> or the melanin? <laughs> Let's call it what it is. So here are some conditions that aren't part of the normal aging process, but they're more common in older adults. But then again, they can occur at really truthfully any age, depending what other types of conditions they have. So this is how it looks for someone who has a cataract. And so basically that's a clouding of the lens. And then the macular degeneration is the deterioration of the macula. And it's really from this deposits of what they call drusen. And they just think that it is um, like deteriorating tissue that forms on the macula. And so it's a loss of central vision. So sometimes you'll see people, if they're picking up a piece of paper and they're going around it like this, they're trying to, you could tell that their field of vision isn't correct. And so that's when you would want to do a, get an eye exam for them. And then glaucoma is that increased intraocular pressure, which presses on the optic nerve, and there it's a loss of peripheral vision. So I remember one time I was, uh, I was meeting with an older adult, and I was, what, what struck me is that, you know, he had, you know, his, everything was buttoned real nice and he was like real everything was in order but his clothes were kind of dirty and it almost seemed like a contradiction I thought isn't that just sort of a little unusual so I did a visual exam on him and he had macular degeneration and glaucoma so what was he seeing not too much right so I asked him I said well how, how did you get here today and he said I drove I said oh how did that go and I'm thinking all I could think of was Mr. Magoo in my brain so Anyways, you know, the, really the importance of yearly eye exams to determine are there eye changes and, you know, what you can do to try to manage some of those. This is a concept called visual cliffing. Has anybody heard of this before? So you see how there's this dark line in the middle of the white floor. What could that give the impression of if you're not familiar? And there's also changes in depth perception for older eyes. So what could this give the perception of? Right, a step a hole, you know, it, it's hard to, and again, I go back to Playhouse Square, beautiful, beautiful place, but next time you're there, pay attention to the floors and the steps and the carpeting, and you can see why we see, and even going up the stairs, um, the stairs are very narrow and steep, and there's no railings, nothing for anybody to hold on to, and the chairs are kind of lower, so it's not even, if you could hold on to the chair, you'd have to bend down, and then when you bend down to hold on to the chair, what happens? Off goes your balance. And so we've seen quite a few falls there. So anyways, just again, that if you're with somebody and you see a change in surface, just letting them know that that's still a flat surface. Um, just some normal out, output changes. Decreased muscle mass and strength and bone density. When do we begin to lose bone density? What age do you think? Yeah, 30s, right? Young. And, and so that would just, again, potentiate over time. And certain conditions, obviously, their bones are already impacted because of what other type of, you know, congenital changes they were born with to begin with. So, you know, even think of Addie. So she has osteogenesis imperfecta. So granted, she's, you know, still relatively young, but my gosh, her whole condition is centered around brittle bones. So it's a defect in the collagen or building blocks of her bones. So she's had, she had 12 broken bones just when she was born. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's a great point. Medications. Just medications can cause a loss of bone density. Um, and just different conditions. And same thing. That kind of comes back almost to the use it or lose it, too. That if people are kind of putting restrictions on themselves, staying in bed for a long time, that the bones do become weaker. And they do increase their risk not only for falls, but also fall with fracture. And then arthritis and foot deformities. You know, we kind of talked about that. Parkinson's. How do people with Parkinson's walk? They shuffle. And, and what are the challenges with that? You know, even with normal aging, there's some uh, loss of peripheral vision. 
And so with the loss of peripheral vision and that changes in depth and accommodation to the eyes, then a shuffling gait, you can just see where, where those um, risks occur. So they'll shuffle, shuffle, stop, and then when they stop, what happens? When they want to get started again. They like propel forward. And even medications actually can mimic Parkinson-like um, symptoms. And so if someone's put on a new medication and you see that kind of uh, you know, shuffling gait or propelling forward, that, that really needs to be evaluated because sometimes medication just needs to be changed or dose adjusted. And obviously stroke. I mean, there's all, you know, you can know the risk with stroke. Um, and then just some peripheral nervous system changes. There's decreased proprioception or kind of where we identify our body in space, if you will. And so when we walk, we don't pay attention really to what our legs do. You know, we, we, cause if we had to look at our feet every single time we walked or every single time we used the brake and the gas, we wouldn't be able to focus on anything. Um, although when I drive, I do get a little distracted. I'll have to be honest. I'm like, oh, look at the pretty clouds. <laughs> look at them. <laughs> so if I had to f pay attention to my feet too, I'd be doomed. But there is decreased proprioception with older adults over time. And Vic is gonna talk about even when you're in the kitchen, how that can impact and increase the risk for falls. And then increased uh, prevalence of neuropathies or you know that numbness and tingling on the bottom of the feet, whether that's from diabetes, um, advanced you know, end stage alcohol abuse. There's so many different types of things that can cause different types of peripheral neuropathies. And so it was interesting. I was, I was actually hit by a drunk driver when my son was just a little baby. And so I always have numbness in my one foot, but sometimes you know, it, it gets worse and it gets both feet. So I was at the gas station the other day and I thought, oh, what am I stepping on? And I looked down and I was like, oh gosh, I'm not stepping on anything. There was nothing between my feet and the ground, but I felt like there was something between my feet and the ground. But you know, what's the problem with that? I could misjudge how I step off of something. And so we had somebody who, she was, you know, a little tiny older woman. And you know how that little ledge by the gas pump, it's only like this high. She stepped up on that little ledge to put the hose back in and she didn't feel it right so she lost her footing and she fell. She was also on a blood thinner so she came in and she ended up with an orbital fracture, her arm was fractured, her face was completely black and blue. You'd think someone beat her and she literally just fell off that little tiny step. And then just changes that it can occur with, uh, within the ear. So do we have any physical therapists in here? Okay, right, so you guys know some of the changes, and what, what are one of the big things that you see with aging ears? What are the little crystals they get in there? Right, that benign positional vertigo. Right, and that can cause a lot of problems. Do you guys treat that very often, like with your groups here, or? I don't. Yeah, and that in and of itself, just those crystals in the ear can really cause a lot of dizziness and vertigo, um, and so really it's just position changes that the therapist will have them do that really makes a huge difference but if you don't know what those are you don't know how to manage some of that and then neural changes and so there's presbyotaxia and so really and this can also be a symptom of a condition and so we're talking about we're talking about vicky so you know vicky used to fall all the time We'd be walking along, I'd be talking to her, I'm like, what are you doing on the floor? You know, and it's like, so she would fall all the time. Well, anyways, then she was diagnosed with a true gluten allergy, has that under control now, and she never falls anymore. So just, you know, again, if someone is a new onset fall or beginning to fall more frequently, that usually is an indication of something new that is happening, regardless of, you know, age or, or what's going on. But we, we definitely see that common. Um, and then, you know, just some of those changes I talked about in the brain with that normal atrophy that occurs in the brain. And think about how much more information some, in someone's in your brain now than versus when you were 16. There's just more to shuffle through for, for one to begin with. But it's not uncommon. Pay attention. Even when you're talking to someone, when you're walking along and talk to someone, you want to really stress a point. Most often we stop, right? Because we want to really make sure we stress that point. And, but then think again when you start that we're not tripping over our own two feet. And there's my friend. Who's that? Mr. Magoo. Oh, Charlie. So that's kind of just an overview of some of the normal age-related changes or, you know, just changes that you need to consider. Um, 
regardless of who you're caring for. Mm -hmm. And Vic is going to talk about external risk factors. Um, one comment that you made back with the normal AI age related changes, you said anybody involved, you know, because of the older brain being smaller and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it, it may not show symptoms as quickly. Mm -hmm. So this is a big deal in our field because we have so many people who are constantly falling and hitting their head and not having a laceration or anything. But we've got these policies like go to the ER, get a cat scan, go to we have people getting cat scans like over and over and over again. So, get their head, so, you go. so you can't use, so the problem is you really can't use the, the obvious injury as your threshold for, especially in a group home where there's liability. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, so I, I don't know what your, what your liability is. In the hospital, if there's any evidence of injury, we do a CAT scan. The, the risk of CAT scan and, and radiation is really, actually we went to a conference last week um, uh, a trauma conference, the risk of radiation is really actually pretty low anymore. The, the studies that came out a few years ago saying that there's a risk of cancer with radiation is, act, there, is actually not, not as significant as they thought originally. Um, but I understand it's very disruptive to not only them but the, the home in general and, um, and expensive, I get that. Um, so it's kind of weighing the risks and benefits. So you know, do you do the CAT scan and not worry about missing something, or do you not do the CAT scan and then chance risking something? So that's kind of that's kind of going to be an internal decision you guys make. Um, but neuro checks are so. I, I guess it depends on number. There's several things: the age of the person who fell, because the younger they are, the less likely that a, a fall would injure them. You have to look at the mechanism of injury. So was it a fall and they didn't hit their head? Um, did they for sure hit their head? You know, was it a witness or an unwitnessed fall? So there's lots of things that have to kind of go into that decision making. Are they on blood thinners? Are they on medications that put them at risk for a bleed or not? Um, and you almost, I, I, you almost need to do a risk, risk assessment. So who makes the decision if they get a CAT scan or not? Or is it just a, if they fell and hit their head, they get a CAT scan? Yeah, and see that's the, and it's because of the liability. It really comes down to the liability piece. So I wouldn't worry about the risk of radiation though, and cancer. I mean, is that what you is that what you're talking? The disruption is more than anything. Right, and the fact that you're putting them in this machine that can cause claustrophobia. I mean, I know that a CAT scan's not small. It's not like an MRI, but. I'm claustrophobic, I don't like any machine that I'm gonna to have to go lay in. I don't like it at all. So, you know, but I think for liability reasons, you gotta can probably continue doing it. I know, I mean, you know, I mean, that, that is, it is like a catch-22, right? I mean, and, you know, one of the other things that Vicki and I do on this side is we have reviewed um, fall with cases. injury litigation cases across the country and provided expert testimony and witness. And so, you know, so if you saw a situation like that, and we're only going by what's in the chart, that's all we know at the time when we provide that first initial opinion. And so, and you know, it's not just based on our opinion, it's on state statutes and, you know, joint commission requirements and the literature and it's, you know, there's all these other things that come into play. But if we saw that, okay, someone fell and they hit their head, let's say on a hard surface, and there was no follow-up, and now they had a devastating injury. And we've seen them where they've had bleeds literally from the top to the bottom of their head. Then it's like, then what do you say to that? You know, it's like, well, where was the follow-through? Well, they didn't show any signs and symptoms initially. It's like, well, you know, so it, it, it is one of those, you know, catch-22s, because it is very disruptive to them. It is for sure. 
You right, know? and so it's really about prevention. And really, so it's about being able to identify good policies for your population and your organization, you know, based on, are, are they falling on their mat all the time, or are they falling in the bathroom hitting their head on hard surfaces? You know, so, but that, that's the glitch, is it just takes a couple of those really significant legal cases that everybody's like, whoa, I don't want to have that happen. And nobody wants anybody to get injured, that's the thing. We reviewed a case recently where a patient fell and within 15 minutes, they were brain dead. So, you know, it's that kind of case that scares everybody. And when they first fell, they were fine. Like, at that first initial fall. And they were not even on a huge blood thinner. They were not on Coumadin. They were literally on sub-Q Hepper. Well, they were on sub-Q Lovenox for prophylaxis. It wasn't even like they were on a lot of blood thinners. You know, that they, they were on, you know, Coumadin and they were taking it forever. I mean, it was not, it was just a significant fall and, and it was a witness fall, but it was, it was pretty significant. And I think you get one case like that and it really kind of changes the, kind of the landscape of things. And I get it, I mean, it's, but yes, I get the disruption. And, and I will tell you, a hospital is not, we are not equipped, we, we talked about this over and over again, and we are not 100% equipped to take care of the aging autism population. We are working on it. It is one of my, like, it gives me chills because I, I know we're not ready for it. I know it's, and it's just, it's going to hit us in the adult population, and we're not, I mean, we're working on it at Metro. We actually have a, a group working on, you know, how do we handle that population. And um, one of my best friend's son is severely autistic. He's 17. He's nonverbal. He is um, very, very severely autistic. And I can only, I have nightmares about what it would be like if he was hospitalized. Um, you know, but it is, we are just not equipped. I mean, peds hospitals are equipped, but I've seen some, not at our hospital, but I've, at some other hospitals in the system, um, other places, I've seen some nightmarish things with kids because we just don't, we're, you know, we've kind of handled some other populations, but we're not fully ready for that to hit us because we don't, we ha they're starting to age into adulthood and parents have taken care of this group of population at home, but we're gonna start seeing chronic conditions in this group. And so we really need to kind of get ourselves together and really do a lot of training with our staff on, on the nuances because there, it, that group, that population is very different and there are nuances that we need to understand. And so um, it's kind of a passion of mine. It has nothing to do with falls, but kind of my little soapbox. It, it really, because I will tell you, like I've, I know that I know the nuances for this particular. He's a, still a child, but he's six foot two and two hundred and fifty pounds, and you know he's pretty intimidating looking. I could see if he starts acting out in the hospital, our first instinct would be to tie him down, which would be the n most nightmarish thing we could do to him. Right. And he had Asperger's. Yeah, Right, we have to work with these, we have to work with our patients, not against them. So back to falls, we'll get off of that. Um, we, so some we're gonna talk about some external risk factors. We know that poor lighting, cluttered pathways, stairs, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to make stairs, some of the things that we've learned along the way. Um, obviously furniture on wheels and unlocked wheelchairs are huge risk factors for patients who um, are at risk for falling. We know that this is heading our way, right? This was me a few years ago, before I got diagnosed with celiac. I fell a few times in the winter time, got really, really injured. But there are some safe things that we can do to stay safe in the winter time. Um, but I will tell you, being the level one trauma center for this area, um, the number one admitting diagnosis for traumas is fall from standing. So this is something that is near and dear from our heart and it hits everybody. It is not just older adults that fall from standing. Um, it is every single age group, um, you know, starting even with children, but especially middle age people like myself. So we know that there are some situational risk factors and some things that we do ourselves that put us at risk. Anything that we do that displaces our center of balance, so anything that we do that kind of leans us forward or leans us back, 
puts us at risk for falling. So what are some things that you think that we do that put us, or anything that our, your clients are doing that puts them at risk for falling? Just yell them out. I'm gonna make you guys talk, whether you yeah, like it or not. Tying your shoes, reaching for items, what else? Using their cell phone when they walk. Oh yes, absolutely. How many people do that, Re use their cell phone when they walk? I do that at work, I'm terrible. Absolutely, because what do most people do when they use a walker? They lean forward, right? Absolutely, how many, we see that all the time, people fall forward. We actually had a pretty bad injury recently with a patient who had just had a knee replacement. She fell forward over her walker. So we do see that. So anything that you do, so one of the, one of the biggest recommendations that we make is that when people are living in their home, um, regardless of who they are or what age they are, is that they put anything they use frequently within their shoulders and their knees, right? Because what, what do we often do with our stuff that we don't use often? We put it down low or we put it up high. Anytime we're doing that and we're reaching for something puts us at risk for falling. So um, one of the things that we don't recommend, especially with older adults, is we don't recommend step stools. Although my mother pulled hers out yesterday. She's just moved in with me. And she says, I got my shoes and I got my step stool, and so now I can get the stuff out of the cupboards. I'm like, really, mother, are you kidding me? And when you fall, I'm just gonna leave you there because I can't bring you to work and tell people that you were on a step stool. What happens about this time of year that we see a lot of admissions for? Decorating. Decorating? What else? Oh yeah, lights, Christmas lights for sure. Gutters. Gutter cleaning, yes, absolutely. I always say, hire a kid in the neighborhood, let them clean your gutter. Although I did see on my Facebook page, that's where it was, on my Facebook page, there is a new gadget. It's, a, it's kind of like a fan. It has like a, and it's a gutter cleaner. You, it's a power gutter cleaner. You put it in your gutter and it does this and it shoots the leaves out. I said, I'm gonna buy one of those for my husband because he almost fell off the ladder last year. So it's, again, things that you can buy, things that you can do, to avoid that, because gutter cleaning is one of the most risky things, and we do see a lot of people come in with falling when they're cleaning their gutters, because you reach forward, you pick up the leaves, and you pull them backwards, right? And you're on a ladder. Not a very smart thing to do. So anything that you're doing that makes you reach forward and reach back puts you at risk for falling. So tying your shoes is a perfect example. The best thing you can do when you're tying your shoes is sit down to do it. So little things that we can recommend that will keep people active, but not make them at risk for falling are some suggestions that we make. So a lot of things, and, and, and when you look at the things in Study You and Matter of Balance, these are the, really the recommendations that they make. Exercise and balance training, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're gonna talk a lot about assistive devices and look at different rooms and how you can use those assistive devices. And a yearly eye exam is invaluable. Because you may, your clients or yourselves or your parents may not realize that you have problems seeing because they might be slight, but it might just be enough that it's affecting your ability to interpret your environment. Um, always doing a medication review with your clients, seeing are there medications that put them at risk for falling. So maybe if that's not, you know, if you notice that you're, who you're working with or, or the people that you're around are getting unsteady on their feet, is there something that got newly added to their medication list? You know, is that what's making them dizzy? That's probably one of the most common things that we see. One of the most common offenders is blood pressure medication. So what happens with blood pressure medication? It makes your, right, so you go to stand up and then what happens to your blood pressure? It drops. That is one of the most common causes of falls, especially in older adults. Our, our venous system ages, just like everything else, it's really kind of depressing. And that doesn't happen when you're 65, by the way. That happens, you know, like the inner ear thing. I thought that happened when you were like much older. It happens when you're in your 40s. I had that inner ear thing. Cheryl kept saying, Vicki, you have old ears. I'm like, really, enough. I had to go for that like physical therapy where they like to, well, they taught it to me, where I like flip my head backwards. It doesn't happen to old, like we think old people get that. It's not old people, it's middle-aged people. But the same thing happens with, with hypertensive meds or blood pressure meds. You gotta move slowly. So if you have a client that you're working with or a parent that you're worried about, 
it's really teaching them that, listen, when you get up in the morning, your blood pressure may not adjust as fast, so you need to move slowly, getting out of bed slowly, changing positions slowly. And patients or your clients will tell you, you know, I get really dizzy when I change positions. Well, that's a clue that one of these times they may pass out. So that's a really common thing and an easy thing, right? It also might be a sign that they're not drinking enough because that's another sign that they might be a little bit dehydrated. We're going to talk a little bit about lighting and then going through a home safety checklist, and we'll talk a lot about that. Um, yes? Visual, and somebody, people here might know, is that something that's covered under Medicare, Medicaid, annual visual exam? Well, every two years. Yeah, it's and every two that's, years. That's a lot like podiatrists. When that changed in Medicare, we, we had trouble that with people, you know, it being get paid for. Right. And then if they have behaviors or different things right. can't verbalize, it's hard to get the visual. So, <coughs> sorry. With the visual exam, there are visual exams they can do that you don't have to interact. So there are machines now where, um, so my friend, son that's autistic, he's completely nonverbal. She goes to see an eye specialist where they hook him up to a machine and they can actually do the vision exam without him interacting. So there are vision machines that can do the test and measure his eye acuity without him interacting. So that's one nice thing. So there are specialists. You have to go to an ophthalmologist, though, not an optometrist. So that is the difference. So um, if you have someone who wears glasses that has a disability and might not be able to participate in an eye exam, they need to see an ophthalmologist. And their eyes have to be dilated for that exam. It can't be done by an optometrist, and that's why you have to see an ophthalmologist. So keep that in mind. If you have someone you think might be having vision problems, that's the way it has to be done. That's what's really great about technology is we don't have to do the E and the, you know, is it better here or better there? I don't even know why we do that anymore because the technology is that they really can measure your visual acuity without it. Yes. Yeah, we should all get up and stretch, right? I want everybody to stretch like that. Do you see her? She literally has her leg up on the pole. If everybody could do that, nobody would ever fall, right? I want to do that. But we know that, we know that people who have good flexibility and good balance typically will not fall. Although I, I, I did learn something recently that um, concussions, so anybody who do, does hit their head, um, I learned this from a chiropractor uh, recently, uh, but anybody who does fall, even though they might not have signs and symptoms of a fall, that con kind of like little bit of concussion really puts people, um, really messes with people's proprioception. So they might not have the physical signs of a concussion, but that's something that you need to watch them for because their balance really may be affected by that concussion, kind of post-concussive syndrome for a very long time, even though they might not have obvious signs of a concussion after that kind of head trauma. So my, for example, my daughter got elbowed, she dislocated her jaw. She really had zero signs of a concussion by what we would consider the traditional concussion test. But when they looked at her proprioception, so they had her balance on her foot. She's a gymnast, so she balances on a little balance beam all the time. She actually could not balance on one foot after her concussion, but like could remember, she passed all the concussion tests, but that could not balance on one foot. So keep in mind, your clients may not be obviously concussed or may have hit their head and they might look fine and be acting fine, but keep in mind they might lose their balance because of kind of that post-concussive syndrome. So we love Maxine. She likes to exercise. I would like to exercise this way. She starts with a few butt kicks, then some middle finger lifts. After that, she winds up with some mooning and for speed and accuracy. We love Maxine. I, we, went, we might be a little bitter and jaded. Yeah, we're on videotape. We didn't cuss, though. All right, so, so we're going to go through some environmental modifications, a little bit about adaption equipment, some lighting, things like that. So this is our favorite. Have you ever seen this in anybody's house? This is so cheap. It's so cheap. Has, has any, nobody's ever seen this? All right, can you see what it is? So it's a little C-clamp. You can buy them on Amazon. And by the way, everything that we talk about today is like nothing we have. If we had any interest in it, I'll tell you, we would not be here today. We'd probably be sitting at home on the couch. 
but it is like a little, it's a, called a cane holder. You can buy them on Amazon for like six bucks. They are little clamps that go. We recommend, we tell people that if they want to, um, the places we recommend in the house are the kitchen and the bathroom. Because what happens with people's canes? Where do they end up on? The floor, right? Because they hook them on, you know, they work, they go in the kitchen, they go up to the sink, they put them on the counter. Where do they end up? On the floor. Then what do they do? Bend over in half, right, which is the worst way you could bend over, right, in, in half. My mother does that all the time, and my kids are like, bend with your knees, because she did fall and break her hip. I'll tell you a little story. A few years ago, five years ago to be, to be exact, my mother, who was 75 at the time, very active, went home to get some tomatoes from her garden to make some tomato salad for my kids. She saw some tar, so it was June, maybe July, she saw the tar, because she was going to tar her foundation of her patio. And she said, oh, the sun has been baking that all day. Today would be the perfect day to tar the foundation of the house. She saw a screwdriver. She said, OK. So she bent over in half, because that's how you're supposed to do it. She spread the tar on the house. Then she took the screwdriver, because that's safe, and spread it, and then fell and broke her hip. So number one, she's lucky she didn't crack her head open. Number two, she didn't impale herself on the screwdriver. And she's lucky that her neighbors were home for a funeral that day, because she still would be laying there. Well, probably not this long. But we wouldn't leave her for five years. But I, I, so I met my mother in the emergency. She had no phone in her backyard, laying on the ground screaming in pain, because she had fractured her femur completely through. But you know. Had she have done some safety things, like not bent in half, maybe got a chair and sat down. But you know, you're talking about someone who thought she was just gonna you know, take two minutes to tar the foundation of the house, because that's what normal 75-year-olds do on a hot summer day. And she was probably dehydrated. Um, you know, she's very lucky in that case, but a lot of older adults or even you know, people with disabilities might not have been so lucky. But you know, a cane. And she's, she's one of the worst offenders. She has her cane, she lays it on the floor. She actually lays it on the floor. She doesn't even bother letting it fall on the floor. She lays it on the floor and then picks it up. So very cheap. You clamp your cane into it. We recommend it in the kitchen and the bathroom. Um, those are the two most common places that people fall and get hurt. Why do you think they fall and get hurt in the kitchen and the bathroom? Because it's hard surfaces, right? They're, they're not carpeted typically. Um, couches don't typically hurt people. You know, typically they're getting hurt in the bathroom and the kitchen. So we know that lighting is good, right? We need good lighting in a room that they, pe people need to be able to interpret their environment. But there is too much lighting, so we worry about, excuse me, glare. So you know, and you guys all know, you're driving towards the sun on a on a really sunny day. It can really blind you, and the same can happen in a home. So we do recommend that um, shades, shears, something that's going to kind of um, buffer that light on a really sunny day is a good thing. That really that we have lighting that's not too bright. And they really have done a lot with um, you know, light sources and not making lamps that are really bright lights. Now everything's kind of muted. But really, the other recommendation we make is that because of the way that our eyes change over time, and again, it doesn't happen when you're auto, you know, automatically you turn 65 and your eyes change and they don't accommodate light anymore. It happens slowly. Um, we recommend that there, there is a path of night lights from someone's bedroom to the bathroom and back so that someone never has to turn on a light in the middle of the night. So um, there is some research to say that night lights can interfere with good sleep, and that red light is better than white light for night lights. Although it doesn't really matter how well you sleep if you fall and break your hip in the middle of the night, because you won't be sleeping at all. So we say, you know, a night light is better than falling. Um, but if you do want to kind of, if you're not a good sleeper and that night light might interfere with your sleep, there's some research to say that a red night light actually is better. And you really never want to get a really bright night light because it's going to do the same thing as turning on that light in the middle of the night. You want to get kind of a muted night light. And there are some night lights out there that aren't really bright, something that your eye is going to adjust to. But we do recommend that for anybody, that there is a night light uh, kind of path all the way to the bathroom and back. 
What about floors? What are some dangerous things you've seen in houses related to floors? Cords, absolutely. My mother wants to run one across her doorway right now. We're in, a, we're in a fight. She just moved in with me last week, so we're in negotiations. I said, really, I'd like to not die of a fire, please. Thank you. What else? Cords, terrible tripping hazard, right? What else? Throw rugs. Throw rugs. So we did this presentation yesterday, and there was a woman in the audience. So. I always say throw, her, what's the argument with throw rugs? To keep the carpet from wearing out or the floor, and I like them. Right, so I always say, yes, it'll be much easier to clean your blood off the throw rugs. That's, that's my argument. I mean, it's true. I mean, sometimes it got to be a little bit blunt. And when you have a relationship with, that was my husband told me when I told him, we had carpeting on the stairs going into the basement, and the kids had fallen a few times. And I said, yeah, but the carpeting's, you know, nice and he said yes you know very easy to clean their blood off when they fall down the stairs but yeah I mean so you you want to say okay so some of the negotiations we've done over the years when we've done presentations we've said okay don't get rid of them all at once can we try maybe one every few months what are some other things you can do to make because some people are just not going to get rid of their throw rugs what are some things you can do to make them safe Are there things, such things as a safe rug? So minimizing the height. So I will tell you, um, they have made some really nice rugs for the kitchen, especially. So um, the nice foam kitchen mats that have a beveled edge are better than, better than having just a regular rug. I'm not still thrilled with them because you still have to step up or step down, but the beveled edge helps. Something that may, um, have a rubber backing so it doesn't slide, helps. Um, we definitely don't like them in the bathroom because if you do fall, and in the kitchen, because if you do fall, you typically get hurt. Um, but we do try to minimize throw rugs. But they, ru rubber backing is probably one of the things that we recommend. Um, we definitely recommend getting rid of small objects. What about pets? Good, bad? Huh? They can bite. They can bite. They definitely can bite. Especially if they're not your pets, right? Are they good for, for people, clients, yeah. patients? How many people say yes? I will tell you, we have, seen, we have seen pets actually save patients' lives. I will tell you, they are sometimes their best motivation to get back home. You know, patients that you've seen come back from illness that you have never, ever think that they're going to come back from because their motivation, it's kind of like your kids when you're young. You know, horrible things can happen to you and you're like, God, I don't know how they got through that. Well, they got through it because they had to get better for their kids or they had to do something because of their kids. It's almost like your pets become your kids later in life or maybe middle age or maybe if you don't have kids. Um, so we have seen that time and time again. There are some recommendations when it comes to picking a pet. Um, especially for older adults or people with disabilities, if you have problems with gait problems, little animals are terrible, right? An my ankle biters are terrible. I have three dogs. I don't know why I have three. Probably because my husband's too nice. Um, I have three ankle biters, and they are the biggest tripping hazard for my mother. And have actually, she tore her um, MCL in her knee a few years ago, and they are the direct cause for that. They tripped her up, and she tore her, her uh, ligament in her knee. Um, but bigger dogs, maybe like knee height, but Jane's going to talk a little bit about kind of some of the safety that has to do. What about, what other small objects do we see on the floor when we go to people's houses or when we're looking around people's houses? Shoes. shoes. So what about shoes? What about, how do you, do most people wear shoes in their house? No. So do you recommend shoes in the house? Yes. So what kind of shoes in the house? I love hearing from the physical therapist. I love it. Love it. But what else? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Because people want to wear house slippers, right? Which are the worst, right? What else? So backs on their shoes. So if people, I will tell you that most people should wear shoes in the house. And the reason why is because socks are slippery. We did have someone ask us yesterday, what about the hospital socks? We said those are better than nothing. 
But shoes are good. Number one, they provide arch support, right? Although our, they say our feet are meant to be barefoot, that that's the way God made us. I don't know. There's a reason why we wear shoes. I, I don't know. I can see both sides. Um, what else? What about heavy shoes? No. Wear light rubber-soled shoes if you're going to wear shoes. With that. I will tell you, I, I don't love Crocs. I don't love Crocs. I think they're probably terrible shoes for your feet, but that's what my mom wears in the house, and she wears the backs on them. And I think they're probably a great shoe because she feels like she has something on her feet. She has a good sole, a little bit of support, um, but they're not really heavy. You don't ever want to wear anything heavy. Um, when you look at, has anybody ever picked up a diabetic shoe? Are diabetic shoes heavy? Some are, but I will tell you, most of them are pretty light. They look heavy, don't they? They look really heavy, but they're typically not. And those are, you don't want something that's going to weigh someone down. You know, you don't want Frankenstein in the house. That's not going to help someone walk around. The, the problem with shoes sometimes is people spend all day in the braces with that go into the shoe. When they get home, they want to take them off. But the reason why they would get the braces is because of problems walking. Right. That's, that's a tough negotiation right. about. Right. So the negotiation is when you're not walking, you can take them off, but when you're walking, try to have them on. And, and you can share the information. But it's a negotiation. And if they're getting up at night, then they're walking without their braces. Right. Too. Right. I love Crocs myself. You know, a little personal observation. After they get too old, they get really, really slippery. Right. Right. Did you already said that when Crocs get old, they get slippery, so you should not keep them. And they're not cheap. Crocs are not cheap. Although you could probably buy off-brand Crocs that are not really, you pay a lot for the name. So we talked a lot about the kitchen. We don't like step stools, but if you have to have, if, if somebody has to have a step stool, the best step stool out there is one with at least one handle um, and no more than two steps. Um, we don't like anything that, you know, if you have to, like I said, if you have to have a step stool, we don't love them, but, but if you have to have one because some things have to be up higher, um, that's what we recommend. So what makes this a good bathroom? How many of your clients have adaptive bathrooms? So what are some good things that you see in the bathroom? Grab bars. How are grab bars supposed to be? So how do you, how, when you go in a public restroom, how are grab bars typically? They're usually straight. Is that the correct way grab bars are supposed to be? I'm going to pick on you guys again. How are grab bars supposed to be? Well, it, it depends on the, every person's needs going to be different than the universal one. But it's helpful if it's a, at an angle so that your ribs and breasts as well. Right. So there's a lot. There's some research that says that grab bars put in an angle are actually better than grab bars. But it depends. So if someone has the kind of strength that they are better pushing themselves up versus pulling themselves up, so that's one of the things that if you have a client that asks you, how should I get my grab bars? It depends on how they get themselves up. So if somebody pulls themselves up like this, then their grab bar should be at an angle because then they're pulling themselves up and they want to kind of walk themselves up versus somebody, like a lot of our spinal cord injury patients use a lot of this type of strength, so they're using a different type of muscles. They're, the grab bars that are this way are going to be perfectly fine with them because that's going to use the same muscles that they use to get in and out of their wheelchair. So it, it's really not a one-size-fits-all. I also think of my in-laws. So my in-laws are both passed, they both passed away, but they were, my father-in-law was 6'7", my mother-in-law was 4'11". There is no way that their grab bars could have been in the same place in their house. But I could tell you if somebody came to put them in, they would have put them in the same place. They almost would have needed two sets of grab bars, one for him and one for her, because they were, their size was so different. I mean, you know, we took our wedding picture. She had to be on a step stool so she could take a picture next to him. So, I mean, it was ridiculous. So, you know, you got to keep that in mind that the, the things, the adaptations that we put into people's homes have to be for them. It's not a one-size-fits-all. What else? What are some other modifications that we make? Grab bars are great, but they have to be put in right. And they have to be put into the studs of the wall. Do not put them just into, especially drywall. Like I have um, an older home, so my home is um, plaster. 
a little bit better than drywall, but if you put a grab bar into, dry, into drywall and you have someone who weighs a few hundred pounds, guess what, that grab bar is coming down and so are they. So that really needs to be, and that's why when you have someone who's gonna get home modifications, you can't just have someone come in off the street that doesn't know what they're doing. They really should have someone who is a reputable source doing it. What else is in this picture that's really kind of a good thing? And this, these are cheap modifications. You can see this picture, number one, this is not a fancy bathroom. Um, I'm sure a lot of your clients don't have really fancy bathrooms. You know, one of the things they mentioned yesterday was the walk-in tub. Well, those are thousands of dollars. They are fabulous. A lot of people are not willing to make permanent modifications to their house. It changes the value of that bathroom if they're going to resell their house. They're very expensive. But for, you know, $100, they can do some really cheap modifications and make their bathroom somewhat safe. So what else do we see here? Yep. Right, so a bathroom stool. And I will tell you that tub um, shower chair, they actually have really nice ones now. That's kind of an old fashioned shower chair. Number one, they have backs on them now. Most of the shower chairs that you see will have backs on them. And most of them will actually come outside of the tub so that patients can or clients can sit down on them when they're outside of the tub scoot themselves backwards and then bring their feet over them. So they've made them actually even safer than they used to be. What else? You can't really see it, but there's, this actually has a raised toilet seat. So we really recommend that if people can still get up from a lower toilet seat, that they still use those muscles. We don't want people to, to lose those muscles. But if they're having a harder time getting up from a toilet, I live in an old home and I swear one of our toilets was like on the floor practically. So it was like, you know, even I in my old age was having a hard time getting up from it. We replaced it eventually, but it was almost on the, bat, on the ground. I, my mother would have had a hard time getting up from that. So a raised toilet seat is an easy, cheap option. And then we love the little shower head, the removable shower head. So people are not trying to, you know, try to maneuver themselves into all different kinds of positions to, you know, take their showers. The other thing that we always recommend is that nobody ever locks their door when they're in the bathtub or in the shower. Why would that be? Right, so if they fall, nobody can get in. You don't want your door broken down. I mean, it's bad enough, it'd be, it'd be embarrassing enough somebody having to break down, to come in and get you out of the shower, let alone having to break down your door. We talk about scalds, again, has nothing to do with falling, but you know, we do, we have had patients who've come in with scalds because on their way down, they hit the hot water. So they fall in the bathtub, they hit their hot water, and then they lay there with the, sho the hot shower hitting them. So we recommend that there are things that you can do. You can set your hot water tank at a maximum temperature. The other thing is there are, I don't, I don't know if we have a picture for it, um, there are scald proof um, protectors that you can put on your shower. But the easiest and free way to do it is to set a max temperature on your hot water tank. What about chairs? So what makes a good chair? So a good height, so something that's not down on the ground, right? You don't want to be trying to get yourself up off the floor. What else? Good firm surface. Armrests, absolutely. I hate sitting in chairs that don't have armrests. Legs that don't go Right, perfect. So a good, nice base of support. What about ch lift chairs? So the chairs that actually stand you up. Good, bad? It depends. So why does it depend? I, I used to think that, oh no, it's better to get the, keep the activity of getting up, getting up. But there are people that are being cared for in the home and a lot with the county board that it's really beneficial because if you don't get, it, get up because it's so much work, now you're not getting up enough. So it's better that you use the lift chair and get up and keep your continence than stay in the chair and not get up. Did everybody hear her? So I'll give you the perfect example. And this, my parents next door neighbor was 99 years old. He was starting to not get out of the bed because once he got in the chair, he couldn't get out of the chair. So he was essentially becoming bed bound. But when they got him a lift chair, that was a chair that he could get in and out of. So for him, it was life changing. 
because he was actually able to get out of the bed. So for somebody who that is their only way they are going to be able to get out of the bed and be able to move around and maintain their continence, it is a great tool. But for those clients and those patients who can still move around and still have that strength in their you know, pelvis and you know, legs, you don't want to use those chairs because it is use it or lose it. So it really becomes a tool once those clients can no longer do that for themselves. So we really do, and they, are, they can be somewhat dangerous. We had a patient who came in who their, their um, remote got stuck and they went to go put their hand in there to get the remote and they, the chair actually flung them face forward. So warn people to keep the remote like outside of the chair. Um, because they can't actually hurt people, so be, be very careful. So this is all common sense. You know, we know that as we hit the fall, you know, there's lots of tripping hazard. We need to keep leaves, ice, things like that. Handy bar, have you guys ever seen this? So this is, it, it's actually um, really, uh, we've, I've actually seen this on commercials on TV. I know we don't watch commercials anymore, but I actually saw this because I thought it was interesting because we've been talking about it for years. So this bar right here, you purchase this, I think it's like $25. Um, it goes in the striker frame of the car. So when you open your door, so when you go outside today, look, there's a little square. And what it does is it allows you to kind of have almost like a handle when you get in and out of your car. It also has like a seat belt cutter and a glass breaker on it. But more importantly, it's kind of like a handle for in and out of the car. Um, fairly inexpensive, again, no interest in, you know, we don't own any. What about these? These are great for you guys. How many people do home visits? Anybody do home visits? Yeah, these are great. Um, these are like, um, tie, you know, they, they are like uh, chains for your tires but for your shoes. They are, um, they hook on the front of your shoes and on the back of your shoes and they help you get traction on ice. Um, and they can go on boots. But you know, no matter what kind of boots you have in the wintertime, you never get traction on ice. This actually cuts into the ice. And this actually is like the footprint of when it goes into the ice. Again, you can buy it at like any shoe store. Not very expensive, about $20. Actually, um, Cheryl has them at her grocery store. Um, she lives in Medina. So not anything expensive, not anything that we have any interest in. Life alert watches, we know that you know a lot of people don't want to wear life alert you know, necklaces because it's kind of like a scarlet letter and um, there's lots of ways to get around life alert now. Actually I, um, I watches or Apple watches now have a kind of an emergency function so you know younger people are more likely to do that. This is just has nothing to do with falls but this is a really great um, medication dispensing uh, system that one of our participants told us about. Has anybody ever seen one of these? You can get them, I think, on Amazon. I think they're not really, um, but what it does is it dispenses a unit dose. So if you have someone who's living independently, but they need somebody to help manage their medications, what it does is if they say the medication is due at 9 o'clock, the medications for 9 o'clock kind of drop down. They take their medications. If their medications don't get taken in a half hour or however long you set it, the, the machine sucks the pills back up and then it, it alerts whoever their emergency contact person is to tell them that they haven't taken their medication so that somebody goes there to do a well check. It's a great system. My parents next door neighbor, my mom, because she moved in with us, used to take care of her 90 year old next door neighbor um, I made this recommendation because my mom used to call there every morning just to check on her. They had a system of like, when she got up in the morning, she turned the light on. My mom turned her light on so they knew they were both okay. My mom would call her, remind her to take her medication. They had a little system because she's 90, my mom was 80. They kind of, you know, between the two of them, they made a whole person. Um, so they took care of each other, but I made a recommendation to her son to get one of these. So this would be a way that he knows that she's okay, she's taking her medications for the day, she's up, she's not laying on the floor someplace. And that if, God forbid, she didn't take her medications, which would be very unlike her, he would kind of get triggered a phone call and that way he could go and check on her. So that way he's not up, you know, up behind her all the time bugging her to make sure she's okay. And let's face it, you know, she might be out working in the yard and he's worried because he can't get a hold of her. 
Jane is going to talk a little bit about Study U and kind of give you a, a brief overview and a recap uh, before we wrap up. Hello everybody, I'm Jane. So Steady U is um, in Ohio here and, and it's um, to help, again, to prevent falls. And in September they actually have an actual falls day. Um, and what they tried to do was to have a goal with all of the different um, agencies or communities to try to um, get people up and moving to help prevent falls as well, just um, increasing some um, balance and strength with just being able to get up and, and walk with people in a group and that type of thing. So their goal was to have at least 4,000 Ohioans walk a minimum of one mile in the name of falls prevention. So 4,000 participants by 2,500 uh, 2, average steps per mile would equal 10 million steps. So this is something that they were, they've been trying to promote as well. And again, preventing falls one step at a time is um, what they're all about. People who think they have no time for walking or exercise will sooner or later have to find time for illness. And then five questions that they recommend to ask uh, the doctor about falls. And uh, can you give me a referral to have my vision checked? So again, that's regarding having your, your vision. Um, are there any assistive devices that would be appropriate for me? Uh, what types of physical activity would be appropriate? Can you give me a referral for a home assessment? Like uh, what Vicki had sp spoken about, some of the different things that um, individuals have in their homes that can be detrimental to them. And are there community resources or classes that could help reduce my risk for falling? And then there is a uh, falls uh, risk self-assessment that they can take. And I'm sorry, could you please be a little bit louder? Sure. I wonder if that's not yeah, here, maybe take this. This is the one that they can hear you with. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry about that. There we go. Thank you. So um, the fall self-risk assessment is um, very helpful, too. So they would want to know, have they had at least uh, one fall in the past year? Again, that makes people more shy and upset about the risk of having another fall after that. And do you use a cane or walker? So these are things that... Um, would be uh, something that's important as well. Sometimes do you feel unsteady when walking? And do you use uh, the walls or furniture to help you get around? Uh, do you worry a lot about falling? And do you need to use your hands to get yourself out of your chairs? Um, having trouble stepping onto curbs as well as uh, needing to perhaps often rush to the toilet. Um, Lessened feeling again, numbness in your feet, and do you take medicine that might make you lightheaded? And do you often feel sad or depressed? And I know we touched on a lot of these earlier in the talk. Okay, we're gonna see if we can get this up on the... Um... Hello, my name is Dr. Sean Liu. And I'm Dr. Katie Davenport. We are emergency medicine doctors with the American College of Emergency Physicians who would like to talk to you about falling and ways to prevent future falls. Have you fallen? Do you have a neighbor, friend, or loved one who has fallen? The answer to one or both of these questions is likely yes, because falls are so common. In fact, one in three people older than 65 falls and half of people older than 80 fall each year. You are probably feeling a lot of emotions right now. You may feel frustrated or upset that you have fallen. You may be worried that you have an injury because of the fall. During your visit, we will check you for injuries. We also want to use this time to talk about the steps you can take to avoid falls. We hope this video will help prevent you from falling again in the future. Falls can be serious. In this video, we want to share with you and your family the seven step fall challenge. It is designed to help you stand up and fight falls. By following these steps, you will decrease your risk of falling again. 
Step 1. Strength and Balance Falls are complex and occur in older people for a variety of reasons, such as changes that occur with aging, such as changes in your balance that make tripping easier. From side effects of your medication or from a medical condition or prior injury that you have. These examples, along with environmental factors and dehydration, can all put you at increased risk of falling. To decrease these factors, you can focus on improving your strength and balance by exercising regularly. Tai Chi, yoga, and other strength and balance training decrease your risk of falls by improving your flexibility and endurance. Plus, it can be fun. Take your partner, a group of your friends or neighbors, and join a gym or sign up for a class. You can stand up and fight falls together. Talk to your doctor if you feel off balance or unsteady. You may benefit from seeing a physical therapist or occupational therapist who can assess your strength and prescribe you certain exercises. Have you been meaning to fix that old railing in your basement for years or get rid of those boxes lining your front hall? Now is the time. Step two, home safety. One of the best ways to prevent falls is to improve your home safety. You can do this by clearing out unnecessary items you can ask a family member or friend for help or even hire someone. First, remove hazards. This means keeping walkways clear and arranging furniture to provide a wide pathway between rooms. Make sure that loose carpets, throw rugs, and cords are taped down or removed from your home to avoid tripping. Do not stand on chairs or stools to reach for items. Second, add safety devices. Install safety rails in the bathtubs and place non-skid mats in the bathtub and on the bathroom floor. Third, improve lighting. Add night lights to the hallways, bedrooms, and bathrooms. Lastly, observe stair safety. Install railings on both sides of the stairs and use them when going up or down to avoid falling. Step three, medication. Many medications, both prescription and over-the-counter, can make you feel lightheaded, dizzy, or sleepy. These medications will increase your risk of falling. As we age, these side effects become more common and can be more severe. The medications that most often cause these side effects are anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants, allergy medications, prescription pain medications, and sleep aids. Figuring out how to manage these side effects can be difficult. Make sure to ask your doctor or pharmacist about the side effects of your current medications and any side effects of new medications you are prescribed or take over the counter. Speak with your doctor immediately if medications you are taking make you feel lightheaded, sleepy, weak, or dizzy. Step four, vision. We know that life is busy. As we age, we have more and more activities and appointments to remember, but we strongly encourage you to always attend your yearly eye exam. As we age, our vision changes. Most often, it becomes more difficult to see things close up. This can increase your risk of falling. Make sure to get your eyes checked every year. It will be much harder to stand up and fight falls without your vision. As we age, our sense of thirst changes. Because of that, we often don't drink as much water as we need. Step five, dehydration. Unless your doctor has told you to limit the fluids you drink, try to drink six to eight glasses of water a day. If you don't like the taste, you can always flavor it. Supportive footwear is very important in preventing falls. Step six, feet and footwear. Poor fitting shoes, clogs, flip flops, and heels will all increase your risk of falling. Always wear supportive and comfortable sneakers while you are walking. Avoid doing other tasks while walking and keep your eyes out for uneven pavement or other obstacles in your path. Talk to your doctor about seeing a podiatrist or foot doctor, especially if you have decreased feeling in your feet from diabetes or other medical conditions. Step seven, what to do if you fall. If you start to fall, try to relax your body to reduce the impact of the fall. Tuck your chin to protect your head and roll as you land to spread out the force of the fall. Stay calm and do not try to get up too quickly. Always keep a mobile or cordless phone with emergency numbers within reach. Phones should be kept in all rooms of your home or in your pocket. If you know you are unsteady or if you have fallen before, you should talk to your doctor about getting a fall alert system. This is a bracelet or necklace that you will wear that will alert your local emergency medical service if you fall. Your doctor can recommend the best device for you. 
Falls are the leading cause of death-related injury in patients older than 65. Over 10% of falls result in serious injuries that will impact an individual's quality of life. With the information we discussed, you can reduce your risk of falling. Please share this information with your family and friends so that everyone knows the dangers of falling and how with these seven steps they can stand up and fight falls together. So steady you exercise tips of the day. Um, again, exercise will help to prevent falls by strengthening muscles and keeping your mind sharp as well as improving your condition. And studies have shown that um, just six weeks of low intensity uh, balance training can greatly uh, reduce your risk of falling as well. And exercise classes, um, this, I know uh, Tai Chi is one that they often recommend for the older individual as well as water aerobics. Using slow flowing movements kind of helps also to build up the muscles and, and strengthen them as well to help prevent falls. And according to the National Hospital Discharge Survey, survey excuse me, more than 90% of hip fractures are caused uh, by falling, which of course can increase uh, your death risk. And uh, this is just again going over the different areas to try to keep your uh, home uh, fall free regarding your floors and stairs, kitchen, bathroom and bedroom. <laughs> And adding contrasting colored tape or paint to the edges of steps can also make your stairs more visible and make it easier for folks. And paying attention at curbs and crosswalks, wheelchair ramps and varying curb height um, can also cause trips and slips. Walking cane safety, um, having your cane properly fitted to your body. The handle of the cane should really come to the <coughs> crease in your wrist. and. Um, Ask a mobility professional uh, about the right cane for your activity level. They tell you not to borrow someone else's cane. And uh, it, the, your cane and the foot on your uh, weaker side should hit the ground at the same time. And then you should also maintain your cane. Make sure that you have a, uh, the rubber feet checked so that those don't cause issues. And the hand grips if they uh, need replaced. And then preventing falls with pets in your home. Um, don't step over the pet, make them move. Uh, feed your pets away from the walkways. Clean up any spills um, immediately so you don't slip into anything that has um, spilled. Teach them not to jump on people. Get your uh, pet plenty of exercise so it be be behaves uh, better at home. Use the night lights or flashlights uh, to help see your pet at night. And if your pet pulls while on the leash, you might be needing somebody else to help you with that walking of that pet. And then keep pet toys and beds away from the walkways as well, reducing clutter. And then autumn and winter mean less sunlight, so you'd want to invest in extra lamps, night lights, and exterior pathway lights to uh, help get around easier as well. And just um, this falls uh, risk self-assessment you can also get on the site there, uh, with the website there, to find other additional information. And then how to get up from a fall. So uh, one of the things that I, we can't pull up the video because we don't have internet access, but one of the things that's often asked of us is um, how to get up from a fall. So there's a great video that comes from actually Canada, uh, but the just a brief overview, how, really how to get up from a fall, is we recommend that most people get up from a fall by getting up on all fours. So first, kind of getting your bearings, obviously. Getting up on all fours, getting to a really solid piece of furniture, a chair, a table, something that's not gonna move when, they, when a person uses it to get up, and then getting up to a chair. And then always, again, making sure that a provider, whether that's a caregiver or their physician or their nurse or nurse practitioner knows that they fell so they can investigate why they fell and then to look for signs and symptoms of an injury. So those are the things that we recommend. Um, there are handouts that are available so that if you need to leave them in places or maybe you have a group home and you want to teach the individuals who are caring for the people in the group home um, so that you you know want to leave that behind. There are you know, can't, I will tell you one of the things, you know, United States is great, but Canada has done a lot of work with falls prevention. 
kind of across the lifespan, and they have a lot of great tools that you can use. You know, we're, Ohio is great with Study U, but we use a lot of tools from, um, from Canada because they really have great videos and they have great handouts. And those are just the resources that we use so that you can use them. Any questions for us? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>